Hi, I want to thank you for checking out the Anchor Church podcast. I want to let you know about the Anchor Church app that you can find in the Apple and Google App Store. There you can find upcoming events, different things about our church, different ways to get involved, and also past messages. It's the best way to stay connected to everything that's going around Anchor. Also, at the bottom of this message, if it's your first time checking out Anchor, or you're a regular person that watches our messages online, there's a button that says Connect Card. We want you to hit that button, fill out the information. If you need prayer, if you just want to give us an update, or if it's your first time, it's the best way to stay connected. The second thing is, is if this message has impacted you, and you'd like to financially contribute to Anchor Church, there's a button that says Give. We would love for you to partner with us in everything that God is doing in the Toledo area right here at Anchor. Thank you so much, and we hope this message impacts you. All right, good morning. How y'all doing today? Right? Yeah, y'all got to wake up because I'm going to start yelling, throwing stuff. I don't know. Um, It might get weird in here if y'all don't wake up. I know it's real vibey and we're all acoustic and chill, but I'm about to yell and get crazy and probably say something awkward or weird, but uh, I'm so happy you're at church today. Anybody excited to be here today? Yeah? All right. We got some people hiding. We got a light out, so it's like in the shadows over here. And, uh, but uh, I am so excited. Uh, Man, I, the last couple of weeks, God's been, man, I've been waking up on Sundays. Not that I'm not ever not excited to be here, but there, it's just been special. Like God's been doing something in me and uh, I've been so excited to be here every week and for us to gather together. And I think, man, I, I hope you guys have been enjoying the series we're in. And I think, man, it is God ordained as we are studying the book of Genesis and talking about it. Uh, man, I, I, I'm just really excited about what's happening. I'm excited about this worship night that's about to happen. Um, it has nothing to do with Anchor. Uh, this is not an Anchor thing. You will not see Anchor flyers or anything about our church there. It's about our city. It's about God. And we're just going to come together and worship. And man, I'm hoping people turn out. It's going to be good. Uh, we'll have some treats there if you're a treat person. Anybody like treats? You know, if, we fee- if you feed them, they'll come. Um, so we're going to feed you. And uh, I'm just really excited uh, for the worship night. So as John said, make sure you're inviting people. Make sure people are coming out. Um, make sure uh, that, that you're just out there uh, taking the opportunity to uh, invite people into the presence of God. So, I mean, that's what we're here for. So let's do it together. But uh, did anybody enjoy trick or treat? Any trick or treaters in here? Or yeah, all there's some kids right there. Like, oh man, candy right now. Uh, Man, my kids loved it, even if it was rainy and cold. Anybody like, like anybody, nobody came to your house because it was bad outside? Uh, yeah, a couple people. I know Greg, uh, the pastor over at 321, he said they had like one kid come to their door. They live in West Toledo, and they had one kid come through uh, because of the weather. But our neighborhood, people turn out for trick-or-treat, even in the rain. They were, they were trooping it out. We, uh, we set up the anchor stuff, and we did hot chocolate and hot apple cider, and we had this whole plan, right? We were like, we're going to do trick-or-treat. This is going to be awesome. Our neighbors, we've done it before, and they loved it. Um, actually, kids came back this year looking for our tent, but we were setting up everything, and all of a sudden, the wind picked up around 5 o'clock. Anybody who was outside during that, it just started blowing. Things were flying all over the place, and I said, this is not going to work, right? So we had to change the plan, so we set up a whole setup in the garage and my wife's uber creative Uh, if you don't know Lauren she's our children's pastor she's down there right now but she put Christmas lights all over the garage and and she had like a little space heater that wasn't doing any good but uh it made you feel good if you were right next to it and so we set up and said we just want to bless the the neighborhood bless our children and uh you know we we just want to give back and so it was a great night but it was not the original plan right we we our original plan we had you know Seth was supposed to be in a Spider-Man costume dangling from the tree. Some of you guys think I'm kidding, but I am dead serious. We are going to force him to. Uh, When you're an intern, you just do what you're told and you don't ask questions. You just get up in that tree. And, uh, but we, we showed grace. We said, we're not going to make you go climb in a tree. We should have still done it, Zach. We should have made him get up there. But, uh, but we, we had all these plans. We thought we knew what we were going to do for the night. We had everything planned out perfectly. And sometimes things just do not go, but it was still a great night. Anybody planners in the room? Like you are the person, you try to plan everything in your life out. Like you know what's happening at what time, 
when it's happening. And uh, most of the time, I, I have learned to be a planner. I have ADHD, so I am naturally not a planner. But in order to fight my ADD, I plan everything in my life. And uh, most people who are planners, when plans don't go normal, it derails your life. Anybody like that? You don't have to confess, but some of y'all, some of y'all are. Your plan. When plans do not go how you want, it just messes up everything. Like it feels like you're a train just flying off the tracks. Megan raised her hand in the back of the room. And it's funny, Megan's on our lead team. And uh, I, I have a tendency to change meetings because I forget stuff. And uh, I'll move meetings around. I'll change times. Every time I change a meeting, Megan loses her mind. And so now I just change meetings for no reason, just to make her mad. And I'm like, this is just going to set Megan off. So I'm going to move this meeting to Wednesday or some weird day. I'm going to change the time by like a half hour just because I know it will stress her out so much. And uh, if you're a planner, I sympathize with you. I don't understand you all the way, but I sympathize with you um, because there are people in the world, planners are good, but you have to understand that sometimes plans don't go how we, how we thought they should be. Sometimes things change and, and things get rewritten. And for some of us, there is a struggle in that. For others of us, there is a freedom in that. We love to live in the freedom of change. We don't plan anything. You're just like, you're just like a, a, a leaf in the wind. I could have said that a different way, but I went with a leaf. And, and you, just, you just kind of flow with whatever is happening. And so this morning, I want to talk about this idea of, of, of plans changing, of, of things being rewritten, because something happens within us when, when, when something changes. And, and also, there, there's something interesting about God, because God is in this, uh, he has this tendency to rewrite things. If you read through the Bible, there's stories. We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah in this series and how God had this plan. And, and Abraham goes to God and says, if you'll do this, God, will you spare? Will you, will you save Lot? Will you save his family? And, and God kind of, he doesn't change his mind, but he changes the plan. And if you read through the scriptures, there's stories like Jonah. And there's stories in throughout Jesus' life where God has a plan, but he changes it in order to have a greater impact. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Genesis 28. Uh, we, we started on this journey as we're closing up this series talking about Jacob. And we've, we've entered into Jacob's family as we're going through the book. And uh, last week we talked about how Jacob goes to Esau. And Esau compromises his birthright and his blessing for temporary comfort. And I hope some of you that responded last week or maybe you listened to the sermon online, as we've been talking about becoming comfortable with compromise, you begin to even reflect throughout this week of what areas in your life are you compromising in and, and putting some stakes in the sand and saying, I'm not going to compromise on this anymore. But, but we have these two brothers and, and Jacob goes to and he robs his brother of this. He deceives him. And the Bible says Jacob flees away. He's scared for his life. His mom actually tells him, run, because your brother is going to murder you. And so he runs off, he flees out of his selfish ambition in Genesis 27. He runs in fear of his life. And the interesting thing about Jacob up to this point in his life is that his main goal, his main ambition in his life was to serve himself. All he wanted was to serve his needs. How much could he get? How much, how much can he gain to boost himself up? Isn't this, so, isn't this such a good reflection of our humanity and the world we live in? If you look around, everybody is out to beat everyone else. How can I have more? How can I have the most? And so Jacob is in this, and, and, it, and it's a pure look at the sinful nature of our heart. And so the story continues today in Genesis 28. If you have your Bibles, turn there. If not, it'll be on the screen. Digital Bible. Everyone's face will light up at the same time. It's like the Holy Spirit in the room. And so we pick up in Genesis 28 and Jacob is on the run and, and he, he's running from his brother and, and he says he gets to a place and he falls asleep one night. He puts his head on a rock which doesn't seem very comfortable and he takes a nap and it says God comes to him in a dream 
And, 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 and J- Jacob is running, and here's what it says in Genesis 28, verse 13. It says, J- Jacob's dreaming, and he, and he sees God at the top of a stairway, and God says, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are laying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. And I want you to catch what God says here in verse 14. Because remember we talked about when, when God speaks this promise to Abraham in this series, he, he gives him this blessing. And culturally, a blessing that God would give to the father, he would pass on to his son. And his son would pass it on to his son, and it would be passed down through the family. God says in verse 14, your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions to the west and to the east and the north and the south. All of the families will be blessed through you and your descendants. It's the same promise God gives to Abraham. It's the same exact words that they're spoken over Jacob. So Jacob's having this dream and God's on this staircase and he's saying, your your family is going to be blessed. Everything is going to stem from you. And it goes on in verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It's none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took some stone, and he took the stone he had rested his head against, and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. He's making a covenant right here. He sets it up, and he says he poured out olive oil on it, and he named the place Bethel, which means house of of God. See, God comes to Jacob in a dream. Jacob is on the run. He's not really looking for God, but, but, he, but he starts out on this journey. And what's interesting about it is Jacob isn't searching for anything. He's running for his life. And yet God shows up. In the most perfect way, God comes down and he comes to him in a dream. And Jacob encounters God through this dream. And and he has to make a choice, right? He has to make a choice after God gives him this blessing. He can wake up and continue to go for his own desires to achieve what he's been on, to stay on the path that he has been running on. Or he can begin to make some changes. He can begin to lean into the process. He can begin to lean into transformation. See, the opportunity is right in Jacob's face. And he has a choice to make. And I think so often in our humanity, church, let's let's look at it in our lives. How often is God knocking on our door? Is God speaking to us? Are you you hearing the small voice, you know, of God saying, I want to move you out of your comfort zone. I want to stretch you in some way. I have a better plan for you, but it's going to take some change. And I think we get in that tension point. And we begin to fight the change. We begin to fight this, this moment that's happening. And so Jacob finds himself here. And he's fi- met with the presence of God. See, there are, there, are, there are God moments happening all around us. And we make the choice to lean into them. Or we fight them. I've been experiencing this with our church for the last few months. That, that God is working some things out of my heart. He's working some things in me if I can be completely authentic and open right now. There are things that he wants to do within me, even with this worship night that's happening. And, and God's saying, I have something better, but it's going to take some transformation in your heart. You're going to have to walk through some stuff, right? It's like going to therapy. You know, nobody wants to go to therapy. It's like, oh, you're the therapy kid. And you go to therapy and you begin to like lay down with this person. They're like, tell me all your problems. And you're like, I don't want to tell you nothing. Right? And they begin to unpack these things that are within us. And, and we start to open up and it's like an onion and you peel it back and back and back. But it can be painful to expose what's in there in order to be changed. And so Jacob finds himself in this place, not even looking for God on the run. In verse 16, remember, it says, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is this, in this place. And I wasn't aware of it. He's saying, I wasn't even looking for it. His eyes are open. He wasn't just literally sleeping. He had been spiritually sleeping. And so in God's goodness and his favor, he meets Jacob where he's at. And I wonder how often we find ourselves in this place of sleep. I wonder how often you find yourself kind of like spiritually asleep 
And you're just like a walking zombie, right? You're like the walking dead, just going through the motions. And you're just living life, just going through it. And God's knocking on the door and he's bringing moments and things are happening. And, and there's a moment of transformation that comes. And Jacob says, I'm going to lean into it. See, Jacob decides that he's no longer going to run from his past, but he's going to begin to step in to his destiny. And the best part of this story, I'm going to paraphrase what happens next. Jacob meets God and he says, surely this is God. Surely I'm going to follow him now. Like I'm devoted to him. I've met him in this place. He sets up this altar, which we'll talk about next week. He, he pours out an offering. And in this altar, he would bring his family back for years and years and years because this is the place that he met God. This is the place his life was transformed. This was the place where he was dead, where he was asleep, and he becomes woke, right? Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Everybody under the age of like, you know, yeah, all the youngsters get what I'm saying. And, and so he, he wakes up from the slumber and his life becomes alive in this moment. And he steps into the destiny of God. And so he leaves Bethel and it says immediately following, he's on his journey still and he sees a beautiful woman far off, right? He, and the Bible says she's hot. He's like, he sees her. I'm saying what the Bible says. Y'all can judge me, but read your Bible. It's PG-13 for sure. And, uh, and so he sees her and he's like, oh yeah, she is mine. I'm trading five goats and two chickens for her. And so he sees Rachel far off and he goes down and he says, then he finds her father and he says, I'm going to take your daughter to be my wife. And if anybody ever comes into my house and says that to my daughter, I'll punch you in the face. And, uh, but, but this is their culture, different time. He says, I'm going to take her to be my wife. And he says, okay. And, and so he comes up with this plan. See, Rachel's father had two daughters and one was real good on the eyes and the other one was not so easy on the eyes. That is what the Bible says. I am not being mean. No women throw anything at me. It says she was ugly. And uh, that's what the Bible says. So blame God. And, uh, and, so, and so the father actually says, I'm never going to marry this girl off. I need to get rid of her. This is what the Bible says. What a jerk dad. He says she is ugly. I got to trick this guy. And so he tricks Jacob into marrying Rachel. Like he, like you can read the story because it's a little PG 13 R ish and he tricks her. And uh, basically Jacob makes a mistake and he marries the wrong girl and he's mad. And he says, what the heck are you doing? He is deceived. If you can see where I'm going with this. He gets deceived by his father-in-law. And so his father-in-law says, fine, fine, fine. Because you could be a little polygamist back then. And he says, I'll let you marry my other daughter if you work for me all these years. I'll let you marry Rachel. And so he comes up with a plan. And finally, Jacob gets Rachel. Now, what am I telling you this story for? Why is this important? See, I believe in this season. I believe in this moment. God, God wakes Jacob up, right? He wakes him up from his sleep, but he says, you're not quite right yet. I think a lot of times in our lives, we, we want to get woke, right? We want to get right. We see God and we think everything's just going to fall into place now because, man, I met Jesus. I had a good worship service. John was up here singing, strumming his guitar like an angel, looking all dreamy, you know, singing songs. I met the presence of God. Everything should be good. And God says, hold on, stop. You're on the path to be good. You're on the path to get right. But there's some things inside of you that I still need to work out. And so Jacob goes down and he meets this girl and, and he goes through this horrible season of being deceived. And the interesting thing about this story is Jacob starts off as the deceiver, the trickster, the one robbing his brother. He is the one who is the deceiver in the story. But God turns him into the one who was deceived. God turns Jacob into the one. He says, you're going to have to walk through it because you won't learn what it's like. You won't learn about the selfish nature of your heart unless I make you walk through some stuff. You're going to have to feel a little pain because you've robbed the blessing from everyone else. 
And so sometimes as Christians, we wonder why, like, God, I'm devoted to you. Why am I still struggling with this? Why am I walking through this? Why, is it, why does it feel like I'm in thick mud going through life? God isn't punishing you. He's working out the broken parts of our lives in those moments. God is working out the brokenness out of Jacob because Jacob will never be the full son that God designed him to be unless he breaks off the selfish nature of his heart. He had to walk through the dark parts. He had to walk through the dirty laundry before he could fully appreciate the blessing God had for him on the other side. Church, if you don't hear anything from this message, hear this. Some of you are in a season that just seems difficult. It's broken. It's hard. You're wore out. And the easy thing would be to retreat and run back. The easy thing for Jacob would have been to step out of those years of service and just run away right? I'm going to go back to what I was doing. I'm going to go back to what is easy. I'm going to retreat back because when I was serving myself, everything worked out for me. But, but God serving you is hard. Serving you means I'm going to have to expose some things and, and I don't like dealing with it. We don't want to deal with the garbage. And so we run back. And so Jacob goes back to his plan instead of changing it up. Jacob's one of those planners. He could have easily ran back. But what happens in the story? Does Jacob run back? Does he, does he d- d- retreat and run away? See, God wasn't concerned about changing Jacob's actions. He was molding his heart. Everything in this story is leading up to this moment. And, and everything is exposing. See, Jacob was working out his pride. He was working out his selfish nature. And he was working out the entitlement that had been put in him. Remember when he robs his brother, he says, this blessing belongs to me. I deserve this. I should have this. How often do we go to God with the nature of Jacob in his early years and say, God, you owe this to me. Look what I've done. Why won't you give this to me? And so, so God says, I'm going to humble you a little bit. I'm going to let someone make you go through some stuff because you don't deserve anything. The reality is, is it's a privilege to be here. I shared this with our team this morning. It's a privilege that we get to be in this place. It's a privilege that we get to commune with the God of the universe. It's a privilege. And sometimes we can trick ourselves into it being a chore. And so God begins to break this off. He begins to mold his heart. See, everything is leading up in this story to what's about to take place. And so Jacob marries Rachel and, and, and he has his children and he has a lot of children. And some of them are with his wives and some of them aren't. And God's still working some stuff out. And so he has all these children and it says he leaves the place and it takes time and he walks through it years and years and years. Real quick before I go here. How often do we want it to instantly happen? We think it should happen on our time frame. It took Jacob over 15 years to get to the place where God was begin to bless him. 15 years waiting, serving, working through the garbage leading up to this point. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 32, verse 24. And this is, this is where I want to land this thing today. Because this is one of the most beautiful, powerful stories in Scripture says this, Jacob was in his camp with all of his men. He hears his brother is hunting for him. So Esau, he spent all these years running, and now all of a sudden, he's worked through his garbage. God's finally starting to bless him. He gets his son Joseph that he had been praying for, and all of a sudden he hears Esau knows where he's at, and he's coming. And so he begins to divide everything up and prepare for for his brother to come. And and to be frank, and I'll talk about this next week as we wrap this series up, Jacob actually divides his children up from least favorite to favorite. Some of you are like, what? You need to go back and read that story. He he, He takes all of the maidservants he had kids with, he throws them in the front. He says, we're gonna die, they're gonna die first. And then he takes Rachel, the ugly sister, and her kids, and puts her there and says, all right, you're next. And then he takes Rachel, remember the one that he had been wanting more than anything, and he puts her all the way in the back with Joseph, right? The favored child. 
And this is important because this sets up why Joseph is the way he is and why his brothers are how they are. And he puts them in the very back of the line. And so they're all, we get to hear, and, and Jacob, he's still working stuff out. And so Genesis 32, Jacob is all left alone. He sends everybody across, and he's, he's left alone on the other side of the river. And in verse 25, it says, then a man, um, it says, for, sorry, verse 24, it says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until daybreak. I love how they don't even set it up. Like, this man doesn't show up and say anything. It just says he showed up and just started wrestling right? They just started throwing down in the middle of their camp. And so I don't know if he thought he was robbing him, what happened, but they start wrestling. When the man saw that he, Jacob, would not, or he, the, the man, would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and it wrenched it out of socket. This man had superpowers. He's hitting hips, they're popping out of socket. And so the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. See, Jacob knew who he was. He said, what is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. For now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. And he blessed Jacob right there. Jacob named the place Penel which means face of God, for he said, I've seen, the fate, I've seen God's face to face, yet my life was spared. Jacob is in this moment and God shows up again. Jacob thinks I have it all together. And God says, I have even more for you. You haven't completely been rewritten because you still have your past. And so he wrestles with them. And, 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 and I think God was even testing him in the wrestle. How much, how much do you want? Because Jacob knew he was from heaven. And he holds on to him and he says, bless me, bless me, bless me. I, I, I want more. And he's wrestling with God or, or Jesus or whoever. And, and, and this is the point that transforms Jacob. I want you to think back who Jacob was in the beginning. He wasn't the victim. He wasn't even a good guy. He was a crook. If, if, you took, if you took the Bible context and our knowledge of who he was, most of us would say he's a jerk. He's not the guy you would invite over for dinner. He's not the guy you would hope your daughter would bring home as a boyfriend, right? He's a bad dude, and God begins to change him. He begins to change what's rooted in him. And so God comes down because he says, I want to meet you. And it's interesting. God, from the beginning of the scripture, you want to know what's different about Christianity? Is we have a God that just doesn't sit up in heaven, but a God that comes down and he's with us. He wants to wrestle with us. He wants to interact with us. He wants to be a part of your life. Even today, as we're worshiping this morning and I'm standing there, man, I felt the presence of God just moving through this place. Because God is present. And so God comes down and he wrestles with Jacob and Jacob demands the blessing. And I wonder, what if we lived the same way? What if we held on to God with everything we had? You know, some of you guys are praying big prayers. And I wonder how tight you're holding on to God. I wonder if it's like, God, will you do this? And then you just move on with your life. Or are you holding on and saying, God, I will not let go until you come through. The passion of Jacob in this moment, he holds on to God and he says, I want my story rewritten. I don't want to be who I was anymore. I want the blessing now. I want the fullness of who you are. I want everything you have. And God doesn't just rewrite Jacob's story. He completely rewrites his identity. The Bible says he becomes Israel. Israel, the father, the nation, everything births from him. And remember the promise that was given to him. He is transformed in this moment. His identity has changed. Everything is stripped away. The new is there. The presence of God, the kingdom of heaven is happening. And he's completely redeemed in this moment. See, we all say we like a redemption story, right? I think about what's happening in our world right now. We can hear this story. 
And we love hearing like, man, God is so good. Look what he did to Jacob. But I wonder how often we're skeptical when, when God's doing the same thing around us today. Something, everybody in this room, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, you have heard what is happening in the world right now. And it's not political. It's completely spiritual. There's a man named Kanye West. There's a man named Kanye West that, that was a, probably one of the biggest rappers and producers in the world. Came out with an album a week ago called Jesus is King. And leading up to it, and even after it, you heard murmurs of, of the faith community, of Christian community, saying, oh, it's fake. Oh, it's a publicity stunt. Oh, oh, like, this is just, this is just to sell more records, right? He's married to Kim Kardashian. Look at, man, look how fancy they are all over Instagram and, and all this stuff. And, 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 and so you hear all these things, and he comes out with this album. And people started downloading it and listening to it. And then interviews started happening. See, Kanye has been doing church services for probably the last eight months. People called him fake. People called it a cult. People didn't know what it was. Again, a publicity stunt. He's just promoting his album. And so Kanye begins to sit down in interviews. And I was going to play one, but for the sake of time, because I preached too long, I didn't play it. But he went on the James uh, Corden show. Does anybody watch that? The carpool karaoke guy? And uh, anybody see it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? He got in an airplane with James, which the, that dude deserves an award. He might be the funniest human being alive. And uh, he did airplane karaoke. Like straight up gospel choir in the middle of an airplane and they're singing all the songs off this album. It's amazing to watch. Go YouTube it. And uh, James Corden starts asking Kanye questions. And you know, he's going to dig in. He doesn't care. And so he starts asking questions about what's going on and what this is, and, and Kanye's talking about it. But there's one part of the interview where James goes, Kanye, everybody's going to think this is fake. Everybody's going to think that this isn't real. They're not going to believe anything you're saying. What do you say to them? And his response, God, I love it. It's so good. He says, he says if, if someone was sleeping, you wouldn't question they were sleeping, right? And if someone was awake, you wouldn't question them being awake. They're two completely different states of mind. He says, I was the walking dead. I was asleep. I didn't know the promise God had for me. I didn't know who I was. And God woke me up. He said, God woke me up and I, and I can't help but keep the message to myself. I have been transformed. My identity has been rewritten. And so a man that used to be talking about gold diggers and women like trying to steal money and guys just, you know, you know, being, you know, sexual to women and all these things. Now he comes out with an album where this is one of his lyrics. King of kings, Lord of lords, all the things he has in store from rich to poor, all are welcome through the door. You won't ever be the same when you call on Jesus. Listen to the words I'm saying. Jesus saved me. Now, now I'm saved. Completely transforms. A complete album that is nothing but the gospel. Even in a song that he jokingly talks about Chick-fil-A being closed on Sundays, he's talking about fathers being present to their daughters, shutting down so that they can be committed to their family. I've never seen the man smile so much in my life. God has done something to his heart. And he's probably not perfect. God's probably working some things out. But he's been transformed. They said Christianity was one of the number one things Googled this last week on the internet. People asking questions about it. Uh, they, they suspect by the end of his debut, three, there will be 300, his album will be streamed completely 390 million times. 390 million times people will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. People in the projects, people in broken homes, people far from God, people that would never step through the doors of a church are gonna hear the gospel of Jesus. And I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if you don't believe it, but the gospel is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
This man is transformed. And I think of the story of Jacob. And I think of the story of Paul. And I think of Peter. And I think of Kanye West and Johnny Cash and all these people. God is in the story rewriting business. He doesn't care about the past. But he wants to rewrite your future. That is the power of the story of Jacob, is that God comes down and Jacob has a choice to make. Will I hold on to God? Will I grasp on to him with everything? Will I, will I seek after the transformation God has for me? Or will I let it go and serve myself? If you are in this place, God has better days ahead of you. God has things ahead of you that you've only dreamed of. God has a joy that wants to flow from you. God has a testimony he wants to give you. God wants to transform your family. God wants to transform your marriage. God wants to transform your relationship, your lives, your friendships, your job. God wants to bless you. And maybe that'll be financial. Maybe that'll be in different ways. But God wants to give because he's a good father. He's a present father father but it takes us holding on to him and saying God give me more God I want your best God I want everything you have into me and so often we sell ourselves out so often we run so often we, 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 we choose our old narrative than the new will you step into the best this morning as we wrap up today, we're not going to have altar time. I'm not going to ask you to respond. What is God trying to rewrite in your story? What is God asking you to hold on to? What is God asking you to lean into? What is God trying to work out of you? What, what, what prayers have you had in your life that, that you've kind of been soft on, if you're being honest? You, you haven't grabbed, out, grabbed on to God with everything. You're not holding on saying, God, I need a transformation. I need the real deal. I need you to wake me up. I'm all in on this thing. What are you praying for? What do you need more of his presence for? What in your life, some of you, even after we talk about compromise, you're still living two lives. You walk through the door, you get saved every week, you raise your hand, you're transformed, and you go out and live like sin the rest of the week. And God is working things out of you. He's knocking on the door. He's saying, will you grab on to me? Because I want to change your life. I want to rewrite your story. I want to rewrite your identity. You're not who you were, but your best days are ahead. I have something better for you. I want to bless you. So this morning as we go into worship, as we sing, man, maybe you don't need to sing at all. You have my permission to stay in your seat, chill out, but maybe you need to enter into God's presence right where you are. Maybe you need to stand up. Maybe you need to move around the room. Maybe you need to lift your hands. Maybe you need to shout. Maybe you need to cry. I don't know what you need this morning, but whatever you need to hold on, hold on to the presence of God, to hold on to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need more today. I need more than I did yesterday. I need more than I did last week. It's great that you've met me. It's great that you've heard me, but I need something different today. I need that blessing. I need that full portion today, God. If that's you this morning, will you grab a hold? Or will you let the moment pass you by? Jacob could have let go as the sun came up. He said, that was a good match. See you later. I'm going with my family. But God finished the mission in that moment. Jacob held on. And it sets up what takes place. It says, I'm going to end with this. Jacob crosses the river and the next day his brother Esau is coming to meet him. And he sees him from a far off distance and he says, here it comes. God, I've given you everything, but he's going to kill me. He hates me. And he walks up to his brother and no fist raise, no shouting, no condemning for what he's done. His brother embraces him and holds him in his arms and says, I forgive you. See, I believe Jacob receives the blessing. Something happens. Jacob is transformed. And so Jacob enters into this with not defending himself, not ready to fight. He enters in with a humility that he never had in the beginning of his narrative. 
that changes the story. Will you let God rewrite your narrative today? Will you let him give you a new identity today in this place? Southview High School, October 3rd, November 3rd, don't even know what month it is, 2019. Will you let him change your life, not in a little way, but in a profound way? Will you step into the calling, the purpose that he has for you? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, you know the hearts of your children. You know the people in this place. God, anybody that is far from you that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they would be met with your holy presence this morning. God, that they would enter in to your presence and say, God, I offer myself to you. I don't know you, but I'd like to begin this journey of discovering who you are. I want to know you more. For those of us in this room that, that maybe need more, God, I pray your spirit would move in this place. There'd be an outpouring that people would be met with your presence. For those that need to hold on and receive a new identity, they need a fresh filling. God, I pray your spirit would move through this building. God, from the kids wing all the way down to the auditorium, I pray your presence moves in this moment. As we lift up hymns, God, I pray our souls would be renewed. Our spirits would be strengthened in the name of Jesus. We hold on and we ask for more. In Jesus' name, amen.